him his. Uh, I'm a drunk <coughs> to a person. I'm losing my voice, which mm. is a wonderful thing to do today. <coughs> uh, but luckily we have a uh, baker's dozen of people with nice, nice voices telling us good stories about good stories. This is Playwrights Under the... <laughs> playwrights Under the Radar. The idea of which grew out of a frustration I have. I'm a dramaturg and literary manager at a theater in southwestern Norway. Thank you. <laughs> and I like to try to follow American theater, being an American expatriate. I read the New York Times. And that worked out fine for a great number of years, because just about any good play in the US wound up in New York. And that was sort of the point of producing a play in San Francisco, for example, where I come from, is you really wanted it to get to New York, because that's where you could start making money, then it'd be distributed to all the other cities in the US. That was the way it worked then. Now it doesn't work that way, it works in a different way. There's more regionalization. This is thanks to the, the growth of the regional theater movement, basically, where you can find very good playwrights writing tremendously good plays who never bother about New York. I mean, if somebody wants to set up to produce their play off-Broadway, that's certainly fine, but that's not the goal. The goal is to have this regional feeling, in a sense. So here, I, I, I really hope to be able to hear about plays that are as good as those being done in New York, but aren't typical, new, typically New York plays, basically, because the New York plays are kind of typical. There's certain standards and genre elements that you have in New York plays that you don't necessarily have in plays from, from Michigan or Iowa. <coughs> so, uh, we start off with Catherine Balachi, who is uh, affiliated with a great Canadian theatre company. She'll be talking about a playwright I have never heard of, and that's why I'm here to hear about it, <laughs> called Behaviour. Thank you, Michael. So, like Michael said, uh, <laughs> uh, my name is Catherine Balacci. I'm from the Great Canadian Theatre Company, or the GCTC in Ottawa. Uh, there, I'm the Education Services Manager, as well as the Artist Liaison, so I have the immense pleasure of coordinating the Playwrights Network there. And I'm going to talk about one of our playwrights, uh, Dara Title. Uh, because we're producing her show next season. It's called Behavior. So I'm going to read a section of her bio because she says it really well, and then I'll go into kind of her relationship with the GCTC. So, Dara's career as a theater maker has always focused on issues of gender, justice, sexuality, and politics. Her work is as rebellious and radical as it is entertaining and humorous. She is as much a socialist feminist activist as she is a respected and contributing theater professional. After graduating from the National Theater School in Playwriting, she had three successful productions, uh, You Like It in 2006, and it's a collective creation committed to queering and trans-focused adaptation of uh, As You Like It. Uh, Marla's Party is a feminist family drama that looks at female depression and religious extremism, and The Apology. And the Apology was her first major success with the Alberta Theatre Projects in Calgary. And it's about the romantic poets and their experiments with polyamory and feminism. So her newest play, Behaviour, uh, will be produced with us, the GCTC, in our upcoming season. And her unrelentingly intellectual and probing plays habitually attack misogyny and capitalism with a wide open heart and a sympathy for the full characters she creates which are often full of shame and failing hilariously. Now, I like that, I mean, it was a bio written for Grant, so you can kind of hear that a little bit there, uh, but I think it really gets the nail on the head and why she works really well for the GCTC, because she has this fascinating artistic career, but then this parallel activist career. So in her political career, she worked for the NDP, the New Democratic Party here in Canada, and uh, she now works for Action Canada for Sexual Health. So she, you know, ad advocates for abortion rights, all sorts of things across the country. Um, and so she kind of has this parallel career that works really well for us because we have our 
political roots at the GCTC, being in the nation's capital, of course, uh, because we were founded by you know, uh, political science professors at Carleton University, so we like to keep all that together. Uh, and she also, for us, she represents a very rare arc that we've seen, where we started by funding her with a uh, recommender grant through the Ontario Arts Council, and then we bumped her up to our playwright in residence, and she's in our playwrights network, and now we're producing her. I mean, for a theater company that doesn't always commission new work, it's so satisfying to see that come full circle. Um, so, one more minute, okay. Um, so I just like to talk about her work because uh, it works really well in our nation's capital and across the country. And oh, the behavior will also be produced, it's co-produced with Spiderweb Show, mm. uh, who we'll be hearing from tomorrow, as I understand it. So, or on Saturday, that's a Saturday. Uh, but other than that, Dara's great. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, next up is Ilana Brownstein. Ah, oh, very good. Ta -da. Ta -da, here I come. All right. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Ilana Brownstein. Uh, you she, her, hers pronouns, and I am the director of new work at Company One Theater in Boston. And I am here to tell you about a play called Leftovers by Josh Wilder. Um, Josh is a recent graduate, he just graduated this year from the MFA playwriting program at the Yale School of Drama and studied under Terrell Alvin McCraney and Sarah Rule, among many others. He is originally from Philly, where this play, Leftovers, is set. He is a, that's right, yeah, Philly. Uh, that's right. He is a, a former Jerome Fellow, a Many Voices Fellow. He's participated in Sundance at UCross. Uh, he's been in residence at the Royal Court. Um, Claret Center, he's got a commission from OSF as part of their Play On series. And the thing to know about Josh Wilder is that he primarily writes for people who don't regularly attend the theater. People whose stories uh, aren't, uh, he, that they feel aren't welcome in most theaters, and they don't often see themselves on stage. He writes primarily for black and brown audiences, uh, urban audiences, and um, his plays are populated with those stories in ways that are um, really illuminating and compelling. Uh, this play, Leftovers, marries fables and myth with hero stories and pop culture and the challenges of urban poverty and gentrification. Um, the story unfolds as two brothers discover a gigantic Jack and the Beanstalk style dandelion that uh, sort of emerges from the sidewalk outside their house uh, and they have to go on a quest in order to reunify their family and move beyond a search for what they call Cosby Show happiness. And yes, uh, Cliff Huxtable is actually a character in this play. Um, he is an embodiment of respectable black fatherhood and the center of pop culture's story of upper middle class black family achievement. But what happens if your family doesn't align with that narrative? And what do we do about the gap between public personas and, and personal failings? Uh, Company One Theatre has been developing this play for two years and will premiere next month at the Strand Theatre in uh, the Upham's Corner uh, area of Dorchester in Boston. All performances are pay what you wish. This play sits at the center of robust community engagement programming, working within the Upham's Corner neighborhood, uh, not, uh, not at right, that neighborhood, but in the neighborhood. Um, and that, that area faces a lot of the same issues that South Philly does, which is where this play is set. Um, I have a handout to tell you more about all the details. How much time do I have? Great, I got one minute, perfect. Um, I wanted to tell you about why we are producing the play and why I think you should produce the play. Company One is producing leftovers as a way to address the historical and systemic inequities that have led to today's cycle of poverty. We're amplifying forgiveness and the dangers of perpetuating the absent black father myth. We're doing it to amplify uh, the power to dream, wish, and be the hero of your own journey is not reserved solely for white people. The vital role that organizations locally can have in combating gentrification and revitalizing communities from within. And we're promoting a yes we can for black and brown young men in a world that says no you can't. So if you want to read that play and you think you should produce it, I think you should produce it. Come find me and I will happily give you one of my beautiful full color handouts. <laughs> Thank you.
Yeah, next up is uh, Julia Bumke, freelance from well, often affiliated with uh, Opera Philadelphia. Hi, everybody. Um, so, as Michael mentioned, I'm Julia Bumke. I'm based in Philly, and um, I'm here to talk today about Kate Tucker. Um, and the piece that I brought is my program, not <laughs> my actual paper. <laughs> So we're already off to a great start. <laughs> so I'm here to talk about Kate Tucker. Kate Tucker's unique brand of physical absurdist and deeply theatrical playwriting draws on visual arts, meticulous research, and a penetrating observational eye to create pieces that are rooted in the body's power. Her mile a minute plays revel in experimentation with form and in form's relationship with physicality, often in a staunchly nonlinear way. Tarker has a rich creative background that began with training in visual arts at Interlochen Arts Academy. And during a gap year before college, she embarked on a year-long arts residency in the Republic of the Congo, where she was transformed by how she heard language being used as an instrument of power. She began keeping a detailed journal of the conflicts that she saw and heard during this formative year. And by the end of the project, she felt that her ear was forever changed. When she um, returned to America, she was eager to write, and she had a very strong ear for dialogue. At Reed College and eventually at Yale School of Drama, her experiences in the Congo fueled a long-term fascination with the politics of power, race, and class within hierarchies. Often, Tarker juxtaposes disparate concepts in her texts, like war, commedia, and clowning, the mix that prompted her play Thunder Bodies. And these combinations result in pieces that are as piercingly insightful as they are funny. With Kate Tarker, the American theater at long last has a woman comedic anarchist, praised playwright Paula Vogel, adding, I am taking moments of thunder bodies with me to my deathbed, so I have a last belly laugh before the last breath. Tarker is also interested in how Faye Simpson's lucid body technique um, helps performers break out of their physical habits, experimenting with how to use their bodies in non-naturalistic, ensemble-driven ways. I like starting a play with too many ideas, she describes, so that they can cross-pollinate in a weird combination of ways. This approach requires a large amount of research up front. For Thunder Bodies, Tarker used literary theory, journalistic accounts of recent war experiences, and movement-based clown techniques to jumpstart her writing process. Drawing upon her visual arts roots, she also often uses artwork to ex help explore concepts for a piece before she even starts writing. In her play, Laura and the Sea, Tarker's playing space is equal parts mundane office and boatscape, a place where realities bend and overlap. Laura, a middle-aged travel agent, recently committed suicide while on a company boating outing, and her co-workers have started a memorial site in her honor. As time passes, her co-workers' memories become refracted. They can't quite tell what they knew of her and what is invented, what they projected onto her and what was true. The blob billows on stage like a sailboat, capturing their sunny memories of Laura's final hours, even as it reveals the superficiality of their relationships with her when, they, when she was alive. In her life, she was an acquaintance to most and an ex-lover to one, but in death, she becomes a vessel for her coworkers to express their rawest fears and losses. Through it all, Tucker employs physicality as a storytelling tool. The primary differences between being on a boat and working in an office are how you hold your body, how where you are of your toes, and where you locate the horizon, she writes at the top of the play. This specificity gives the play an energy of cautious optimism, and which makes the desperation all the more powerful. Laura and the Sea is both slyly funny and quietly devastating, balancing its light and its darkness to electrifying effect. Great. Um, it's an understated play. There is never a dramatic denouement or a passionate fight over Laura's death. And this allows its delicate mood to simmer without ever becoming maudlin. The blog conceit deftly captures each coworker, revealing their personalities in ways that are equal parts humorous and heartbreaking. Recent years have been a turning point for Tarker's career. In 2016, Laura and the Sea received a coveted National Playwrights Conference spot at the O'Neill. And Thunder Bodies is receiving its professional premiere this upcoming season. In addition to a play that she's written for the Wilma Theater in Philly, um, for their resident company called Dionysus was such a nice man. Up until this point, she's received prestigious workshops, but few productions. Mm. This is really her first year of getting professionally produced outside of an academic setting. 
and she only quit her job, her day job as a paralegal in early 2016. So this is really the moment that she's taking off. Um, and overall, I feel that she's a writer of truly enormous promise and one whose ensemble-driven work should be shared widely. Thank you. Yeah, that certainly sounds like a playwright who's just still under the radar, but it's going to tomorrow morning. Going to be waiting. <laughs> so we'll see. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be ordering a few of her plays, I think. Uh, next up is Adrian Santano, talking about Boni de Alvarez. <laughs> Adrian is with Playwrights Arena in Los Angeles, where he's been the dramaturg, uh, the literary manager for 10 years, 15 years? zero off. Okay. Boni B. Alvarez is a queer Filipino-American playwright and actor based out of Los Angeles. He's one of the most prolific playwrights in the LA New Works scene currently, having four plays produced at four different companies in the past year alone. His work aims to highlight points of inclusion for Filipinos and Filipino-Americans, often examining the way in which Filipino-American identity and queerness intersect, and particularly how those two identities clash against the myth of the American dream. In Ruby, tragically rotund, plus-sized teen Ruby Salazar is shattered when her mother Edwina uses Ruby's university tuition money to fund younger sister Gemma Lynn's blossoming beauty pageant career. With the encouragement of her sexy and supportive boyfriend Lamont and a trio of chorus-like best friends, Ruby signs up for the pageant determined to prove her worth to Edwina once and for all. Fixed inspired loosely by Calderon's Spanish Golden Age drama, The Physician of His Own Honor, follows Miracles Malacanang, the top earning masseuse at a happy ending massage parlor in historic Filipino town, Los Angeles. <laughs> Miracles pines after bad boy Mariano, brother to a surging local politician, who visits her in the cover of night and laments that their relationship would, quote, be easier if. The unspoken being Miracle's recently rejected request for gender reassignment surgery. But the play I'm supposed to talk about today is Bloodletting, a finalist for the Penn Center USA Literary Award and recently re remounted by Center Theater Group alongside Playwrights Arena for Block Party 2018 at the Kirk Douglas. Bloodletting follows two Filipino-American siblings, <laughs> domineering older sister Farah and weak-willed younger brother Bosley, as they return to the Philippines to fulfill their father's dying wish to have his ashes scattered in the Puerto Princesa Underground River. The two, the two arrive by chartered plane and, seeking refuge from a storm, end up at the Princess Cafe, a Nipa hut owned and operated by Jemmy Flores and his granddaughter Lily. Jemmy reluctantly agrees to shelter the siblings at his granddaughter's insistence, and the four engage in a conversation that reveals one of them to be an Aswang, a creature from Filipino folklore <laughs> straddling the border between witch and vampire. <laughs> As the night progresses, so do the supernatural happenings at the Princess Cafe. Using the supernatural as a stand-in for familial emotional manipulation and abuse, Alvarez crafts a haunting, tragic, and at times surprisingly funny story about the weight of that which is said or left unsaid, and how those words resonate long after our loved ones have left us. There is perhaps no better example of this than a small moment that provokes two distinct reactions. When revisiting the topic of their father's final days, Bosley becomes a sobbing wreck, consumed by the loss not only of his father, but the loss of an opportunity for reconciliation that could have been. Farah, the hard-nosed stoic and the favored child of the family, insists that he stop his whining. When Bosley is unable to turn off his tears, Farah curtly demands that he, quote, feel less. And with each passing jab, Farah gives to Bosley, Bosley writhes in pain, the pointed uh, metaphysical uh, realization of their shared pain manifest by this magical realism. Uh, but Alvarez plays always demand that we feel more. They invite us to feel bigger and deeper than when we'd arrived at the theater, and for that, I think they are a wonderful contribution to the American theater. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Adrian. <laughs> Next, we have Amanda Dawson, who, is, who teaches at Brescia University in Kentucky. Did I pronounce it Close. right? Close, Brescia. 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 <laughs> yeah. Not, not Russia, but Brescia. Brescia. <laughs> Brescia, yes. Amanda, uh, she, her, Yes, I'm a professor, a freelance dramaturg, and associate VP of communications for LMDA. And I am super thrilled to share with you a playwright that is ready to be and needed on your radar, Terence Arvel Chisholm. To give you a quick glimpse of him before I dive into his work, this is a recent Facebook post from May 22nd that he wrote. He writes, in the past 12 days, I finished a commission, I secured two new productions, I had a reading of a new play with 27 black actors, I presented a new short play with the Black Theater Collective. I made a list of dope plays alongside a bunch of dope playwrights. I won a Best New Play Award. I had a reading of another new play. I got a new commission. I graduated from college for the third time. And I presented another new short play with another Black Theater Collective. But I personally met Terrence back when he was just an intern for NNPN. And now just recently he did graduate from Juilliard and won the Smith Prize. Um, he's getting his work produced all over the country and has written numerous plays, seven of which are available to download on the new play Exchange. Um, and the play that introduced me to Terrence's work and also made me fall in love with his writing is a play called Breer Cotton. So B-R, apostrophe E-R, Cotton. Terrence is from St. Louis and actually attended the same high school as Michael Brown. At the time of Brown's murder in Ferguson, Terrence was in Washington, D.C. attending school. And according to one article, he was frustrated that he wasn't in St. Louis. So he put his, quote, rage into this play. It has a cast of five and is a dark comedy drama. Um, it's set in Lynchburg, Virginia. Here's the brief synopsis for it. The former site of a thriving cotton mill is now an impoverished neighborhood, deeply affected by all the recent killings of young black men like himself, Ruffarino, a 14-year-old militant, incites riots at school and online. More and more at odds with his mother and grandfather, the boy's anger grows beyond containment, while the family home literally sinks into the cotton field, and no one seems to notice but him. And this play was an NNPN Rolling World premiere this past season. Um, a little bit more about who he is, his artistic statement on NPX, which I think tells a lot about his writing, he writes this. I write plays that span space, time, and multiple universes where memories lecture, elephants sing, and cotton fields grow in kitchens. I write plays where 14-year-old black boys wake up with blonde hair and blue eyes. I write plays where scenes stutter, stop, and then restart again. I write plays for the theater. I'm interested in theatricality for theatricality's sake. By this, I mean I write plays that are required to live on stage. I'm constantly thinking about my audience as I write how to move them, manipulate them, make them uncomfortable, and at once never forget that they are watching a thing that is unique and that can only ever happen one time. I write plays that explore form, break conventional practices of theater making. Since beginning the MFA, which he recently finished, um, I've been very inspired by classic theater and dramatic theory in so much as I want to subvert it. I write plays with their own inherent structure and dramaturgy. I write plays about my experience. I'm a black man from St. Louis. I'm a black man in the United States of America. I write plays that explore themes of race and representation, and those themes are present in all of my work. So you can follow him on Twitter at Theater Thirsty, Theater RE. And I would encourage you to look at his play, Rear Cotton, on NPX, as well as another play, Hood or Being Black for Dummies, which is also about two 14-year-old boys, um, one who writes a manual about being black for dummies for the other one, um, and another play called Black Lady Authority, set in 2020, where three women devise a revolution to put the women in charge. So please check out Terrence um, Arbel Chisholm. thought just occurred to me, and that is that uh, I work with a lot of Norwegian playwrights, but getting Norwegian playwrights to write about something current, like the killing of black men, uh, as we heard about in that play, is very, very difficult. I don't know why, but it really is kind of astounds me that, that it's so very difficult. Norwegian playwrights tend to turn away from current events. That's part of the problem with Norwegian theater, if you ask me. <laughs> Next up, we have Jacqueline Goldfinger, who uh, is affiliated with the University of Pennsylvania, where she teaches playwriting and with Playpen in Pennsylvania. Did I skip? 
<laughs> Sorry, you're on the wrong list. No, 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 we take Jacqueline out to do you next. No Sorry. No I'm sorry, Claire. <laughs> I think I'm an alien. <laughs> what? Wait. I thought we were here for you to tell me you were pregnant. No, what? That's crazy. I think I'm an alien. And that is how Emma Goydell's The Gap begins. It's a story between two sisters. It's a story about family. But it explodes the, what we think of as the traditional American family narrative to talk about issues of queerness and identity and otherness using the metaphor of one sister being an alien to discover what it's like to be the other, to discover the other in yourself even though it feels unknown to you but realizing it's true to yourself and how do you make the journey to yourself once you realize who you really are and decide to embrace it. Again, it's called The Gap by Emma Boydell. It's on the New Play Exchange. Um, I met Emma uh, five years ago when she moved to Philadelphia. She just finished uh, her degree at Barnard. Uh, we took her into our emerging playwrights group called The Foundry, which is located at Playpen in Philadelphia. And over the past five years in Philadelphia, she's developed her work with Michael Quinn, uh, Michael Hollinger, Quinn, Eli, and I. Um, and The Gap was just produced at Azuka Theater in Philadelphia. She was recently invited to be a fellow at uh, the Playwrights Realm. Uh, she's been in the Ars Nova play group. She's found a lot of success in kind of those undercurrent development groups around the Northeast. And so she recently moved to New York to try and pursue taking the next step in her career. Uh, but she has not, unfortunately, found a second production for The Gap. So I'm here to encourage folks to check out her work and The Gap, knowing that she is looking for a second production. What I love about Emma's work is that it is funny, it is heartful, it is thoughtful, it pushes the boundary of craft, but uses humor to invite people in. So often when playwrights try and push against boundaries of traditional theater, audiences feel alienated. But because she so beautifully balances the humor with the push, they feel welcome in to go on a journey they may not otherwise be willing to go on, which is really exciting. Uh, Emma describes herself as a writer and creative producer dedicated to global stories from the queer margins of dominant culture. And while she was in Philadelphia, she not only participated in developing numerous plays in the Foundry, but she also co-founded Orbiter 3, which is our local playwrights producing group. Um, and one of the great things about working with Emma is not only is she just a wonderful person and talented writer, but because she's been a producer, she understands what that means. And so she's incredibly easy to work with in a producing capacity, which is a joy. Um, um, uh, the Philadelphia Inquirer uh, described The Gap as a powerfully contemporary and profoundly female dark comedy about trauma, art, and sisterhood that asks what's worse, forgetting or remembering. And the way that Emma describes the play, her synopsis, is Nicole tells her sister Lee that she was abducted by aliens. Lee goes on a performance art journey to figure out why. The Gap brings them both closer to articulating the truth about a strange moment and their childhood that neither can name, but has changed them both for the rest of their lives. Um, and I'm gonna be honest, I typically don't like theater about art. I don't like art about art. I feel like it's done so much that there is very little new space in which to tread. Um, and so when Emma first brought pages of The Gap into the foundry, like outside I was like, wonderful, let's read your new pages. And inside I was like, holy fuck. <laughs> It's another young artist writing about making art. No, it's going to be great. It's going to be fine, right? So I had that initial response. But what was wonderful is that she completely, the performing art was just something that was a conduit for her sister to understand herself. And so the art making was really intrinsically engaging with, with the story rather than being this put on young artist thing. Um, so I hope that you will check it out. Again, it's called The Gap by Emma Boydell. She has a website, emmaboydell.com, and she's on the New Play Exchange. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you, Jackie. Jackie said something very interesting, that she's looking for a second production. 
that's, that's often the second production that really teaches the playwright what, what, it, what it is we do. Uh, we had a, a, a young playwright who had had several plays produced just once, different places in, in, in the country. And then we were the first theater to do one of his Oslo plays outside of Oslo. And he came to us at, at the premiere party and said, this is, this is really where I learned what theater is, is seeing production number two. Production number one, I didn't really understand. But when you see two, so one plus one is more than two. It's actually three. <laughs> okay, next up, who should have been up before is Claire Hadley. Uh, so, so that we broke with the, alpha, the, the imaginative alphabetical <laughs> And Claire works at the Midland Center for the Arts. And the Midland Center for the Arts is in Michigan, something I didn't know, which is a freelance. Thank you. So hi, I'm Claire Hadley um, from Midland, Michigan, so I was really glad that this year we were in Toronto because I could drive here, <laughs> which was a little better. Um, and I'm going to be talking about Claire Frances Sullivan, no relation, um, <laughs> and she is a New York City-based um, performer, composer, lyricist, and playwright, so she kind of does it all and understands working from both sides of the table. Um, she's originally from Michigan, very close to me. Um, she graduated from Central Michigan University, um, which is where I'm currently getting my master's, so we kind of share, share that. Um, and she started off uh, in the musical uh, theater program there, and she produced her first song cycle when she was a sophomore, um, wrote it and produced it at that venue, um, and since then has written several short plays and a lot of music while she was still at university. Um, and she finished her first full-length musical by the time she graduated. So she was off to a really good start. Um, she then went and studied at the Powerhouse Theater um, training company in Poughkeepsie. So she made the jump right away to New York. Let's get out of Michigan, which I feel. <laughs> um, and so she was working as a playwriting apprentice there and getting some more experience under her belt. Um, since being in New York, she had her first short play, Close Encounters, produced in Michigan and in London, you know, close neighbors there. Um, and when it was in London, it was produced at the Talos Science Fiction Theater Festival, which I think is fascinating. Um, and she was just commissioned to produce a brand new version of The Christmas Carol, because who hasn't seen a million new versions of that? Um, but this one I think is really interesting, and I might be a little bit biased because I happen to be the dramaturg on the project, um, but it's a modern adaptation, I mean, like this year, happening right now, uh, adaptation of the original Dickens story. The poster for it has like a cell phone with like ghost number one arriving at midnight pop up on it. Um, so it's a really neat twist that pulls on like contemporary issues while tying it into the classic that we all know. Um, so that actually is at the Midland Center for the Arts. So that will be produced. She's a recipient of the Kennedy Center's 2018 National Musical Theater Award, which we were very proud of. Um, for her musical theater performance of Fostered Love, which is the one that I'm here to talk about um, just a little bit. It's a two-act musical about two sisters in the foster care system as the oldest sister is about to age out and their, their separation, um, pain, and struggle. And that's something that she kind of ties into a lot of her works is real-life pain and struggle. Um, for example, one of some of her one acts, one takes, it's called It Comes in Waves. It's a one act musical that takes place inside a woman's dream the night that she has to make a really hard decision. So kind of that subconscious stream of consciousness thought that sometimes we think we can control in a dream, but really is just our body processing things. Um, but she also does the straight plays, such as Clean Break, which about four nurses who work in the ICU of a small hospital and how they have connections and disconnections and how they work through the kind of small town struggles. Um, Bruised, which uh, is a song cycle, which I think uh, it's not a medium that's done enough anymore, a song cycle based around the theme that someone's biggest flaw can also be their biggest asset, which is something that I try to pull on as much as possible. Um, so Fostered Love ha has been produced before, but she's also in the process of, you know, your work is never finished, you never completely finished something, and so it's being produced at Festival 56, which is a, a festival in Illinois, which also happens to be where I'm working this summer, so I think she's following me around. <laughs> um, and so we're doing a stage reading as part of our New Works Festival there, which is the first time that we've actually done a full-length piece. Normally we do like 10 short pieces, and so we decided that we wanted to take a risk and uh, invest in her and give her another opportunity to be produced in this capacity. So she is working on signing with an agent like as we speak to become um, fully licensed and you can be able to purchase um, and produce her plays. 
but I her information is on the sheet and she is really actively looking forward to, to new opportunities. She likes collaboration, but also to having her current work produced. Thank you, Claire. Uh, I love musical theater. As long as it's not, you know, sound of music. <laughs> Uh, next up is Morgan Granville. She is a student at the University of Iowa, a graduate student there, in playwriting? Dramaturgy. Dramaturgy, yes. Okay. Hi, all. Uh, like Michael said, my name is Morgan. Uh, I'm an MFA Dramaturgy candidate at the University of Iowa and current artistic intern at Harvard Stage this summer. Um, I'm here to talk to you about Margot Connolly, who has written a play called Tough. Um, as well as many other great plays. Um, I encountered Margot's work uh, in graduate school, which she has since graduated and is pursuing the artist diploma um, at Juilliard this fall. Uh, Margot is wildly underproduced, uh, but I did have the opportunity to uh, direct a production of one of Margot's other plays, Found, um, this past year. And in the process, uh, I did ask her to send me some of her other plays to try to get a sense of her voice and what she's interested in and just kind of what she's thinking about. Uh, and she sent me two striking plays, uh, one called Quiz Out and one called Tough. And I'm here to talk to you about Tough because I remember reading it and being completely bowled over uh, by what I had read. Um, for a quick synopsis, um, I'll use... Uh, the Troubled Teen Boot Camp Crosswind sells itself to parents as a behavior modification program that will help their daughters straighten out. The girls who have been sent here, however, learn it is a place of ever-changing rules, harsh punishments, and ever-increasing desperation. When they hear a rumor that the program will be shut down if a camper dies, the girls plan their escape by whatever means necessary. Um, the play is quite jarring, um, and the girls are truly tough um, and one of the play's uh, greatest triumphs I think is is this kind of thriller uh, structure but it kind of flips it on its head by presenting some non-linear moments that you that really pull you in um, as a collaborator Margot is an absolute dream um, she feels deeply for the young people that populate her plays uh, she's not interested in the stereotypical teenage girl whatever that trope is uh, and she's not interested in heteronormative stories either. Um, she's really interested in the dynamics between groups of young women, uh, their agency and their wisdom. Uh, if you're like me and really energized by this new movement of work about young women and populating them on stage, um, definitely Margot's plays are the plays for you. Uh, she has a new play exchange profile, um, which Tuff is on, and you can check out some of her other work, so you can grab me the chat. Um, again, just to recap, Margot Connolly's tough, and come talk to me if you want to talk about it. Thanks. Um, thank you very much. Next we have Molly Marion. There she is. There she is. <laughs> and she uh, works with Beehive in New York. Hello, friends. I'm Molly Marinick. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and hers. Um, I'm going to read off of my phone. Sorry about that. I'm going to talk to you today about Monet Hurst Mendoza. Uh, she's a New York-based playwright, director, and theater producer, originally from Pasadena, who attended uh, Marymount Manhattan College, where she focused on playwriting and directing. Her, her Wikipedia page, uh, her plays predominantly feature people of color and often deal with heavier subject matters such as morality, exploitation, and corruption. She explores themes of race, culture, and identity in her works and constructs characters that develop unconventional relationships and overcome situations via unique escapist approaches. I just thought that was a really great way to talk about her, so I figured I would quote her directly. <laughs> um, in New York, she was a, a lab member at the Women's Project from 2014 to 16, and then she was a member of the Public Theater's uh, EWG Emerging Writers Group in 2017. And she was a Van Leer playwriting fellow in the 1618 group. So she's just finishing that up now. Um, and she has, uh, she's also involved in um, Rising Circle Theater Collective. And she's developed a lot of work there, along with the Cla Looking Glass Theater Company and Classical Theater of Harlem. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about her play Veiled, which just had uh, its, I guess, world premiere at Astoria Performing Arts Center in Astoria. Um, and this is a play that. Uh, 
is technically Monet's like first like real production, um, but she has a couple other things sort of in the works. Um, so th what what Veil is about again in her words. Um, they're better than mine. Uh, the, the play is a modern day twist on the Rapunzel fairy tale. It focuses on an Afghani couple that immigrated to the US from Afghanistan at the height of Taliban rule to create a new life for themselves. After difficulty conceiving, they gave birth to a daughter, Dima, with a rare allergic reaction to the sun. So as a result of her, her illness, the young girl becomes more sheltered and finds safety and comfort wearing her mother's old burqa. Though her parents worry about her future and are dismayed at her choice to wear the burqa as it symbolizes the life they escaped, the audience gets to watch how Dima grows into young adulthood with the help of some secret friends. Okay, so those secret friends are a street poet who forms a relationship with Dima from outside her window, and um, a shark that Dima orders online, who is a puppet. Um, so what I love about Monet's writing is how she's able to talk about big picture conceptual issues while staying laser focused on who her characters are. And Veiled is about personal identity and the individual ways that we value and honor our culture, um, feeling like an outsider, being a minority in America today, heavy themes like that. Um, the writing represents this world uh, as we know it to be in, it, in its heaviness. However, uh, Monet does excellent work not indulging in the stark reality of all that those themes have to offer. So there's room to bring in a big puppet shark in a truthful way that isn't schmaltzy. Um, so her work sort of honors big ideas with, without, uh, with, while escaping being indulgent in, those, in the message. Um, and so I got to know Monet's writing. Um, I directed a short play of hers in summer 2015 uh, with the Oneness Project. And the title of that play, um, it's just, it's one scene, it's about 10 minutes long. And the title is Meat or Thin Girl Stretching. Um, so as you'd expect, it looks at objectification. Um, and in the play, four uh, sort of vapid women speak of body image and their desire to be beautiful, all while pining for Dave to eagerly return to them. Um, and as they're doing this, they are stretching and getting limber and wearing spandex. Um, so uh, they are. Uh, so when Dave finally does make his appearance at the end of the play, um, to their absolute drooling delight, the audience sees that he's dressed as a butcher and hungrily holding a meat cleaver. Um, so the women are, are oblivious, and the play ends before we learn what happens next. It's obviously not very very subtle. They're literally meat. That's what the play is about. Um, but this twist shows how Monet's stories use directness to make her point. Uh, while never aggressive or didactic, she's great at using common familiar worlds to portray extreme concepts that stand for something meaningful. Um, so I think that Monet's talent as a storyteller and her wonderful and generous imagination uh, will lead to a long career as a playwright. I think she has a lot more uh, to give to the world of theater, and this is just the beginning and the tipping point for her. And I hope that her work gets opportunities regionally because I think her stories are beautifully universal and her interest in identity and culture is something that resonates in communities that aren't big metropolitan areas. So I hope that she gets to have her voice shared uh, sort of across the country and the world, as well as just in New York City, where she happens to have built her career. So again, her name, her name is Monet Hurst Mendoza. The play is Veiled, and uh, ask me more about it later if you want to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Molly. Next up, Jeff Prohl, University of Puget Sound. Needs no introduction, thanks. <laughs> but he got one anyway. <laughs> It begins with a letter. A young woman has written a young man. Once, a time, once upon a time they'd been friends, or maybe something more than friends. Now they have been separated for months, maybe longer. The woman's father, a preacher, objected to the young man, and she had not been ready to disobey his wishes. And so for this and perhaps other reasons, they parted. The letter, as letters will do, had gone missing. But as soon as the young man, or man, gets it, he goes in search of its author, Nina, although all he has is the name of a town, a place in the North Country. With the help of the village post office, he finds her about 10 miles outside of town at an old, isolated house. The letter had concerned our man because Nina seemed so sure she had found a radical new truth. She had left her home to join a strange band of believers led by a charismatic prophet named Timothy. This was not the Nina that once upon a time Armin had known, someone who had been a seeker after truth and meaning, who enjoyed the journey as much as the destination. The Nina of the letter had traded questions for answers, and the answers seemed dangerous in the way they appealed to a mind weary of complexity with predictions of a coming apocalypse, predictions delivered by a chosen one, someone assembling a small community of believers, 
to face with him the end of days. When Armin and Nina finally meet in the front room of the old house, she greets him warmly, but she has no memory of sending a letter, of calling out to him, even obliquely. All he asks from her is that she go with him for a walk, that for a few minutes she step away from the house that has become a home for her and others who are so sure of what they know. And this, at one level, is the fundamental tension around which Russell Davis's new play, Trespasser in a Promised Land, is built. Will Nina leave one, splay, one space, the room that epitomizes the enclosure insisted upon by our newfound community for another space, one open to change? The central elements are archetypal, a room, a letter, inside, outside, the space between two people. What might open that space? What might close it down? What is most important about this room in this play is Nina's refusal to leave it. For our men, a conversation, active, open-ended, listening and speaking, cannot begin within its walls. The room is whatever makes existential change impossible, or nearly so, and in this sense, Nina's room may not be so different from rooms of one sort or another. We all may, without knowing it, find ourselves in, even if this particular room, Nina's room, has been more maliciously designed. At a time in which citizens of many countries find themselves increasingly isolated from one another in a range of ways, culture, class, politics, ideology, this image of a room that separates and encloses is crucial to an understanding of who we are and how we might be. Letters, or in earlier forms, messages delivered by messengers have an even longer theatrical lineage, lineage than dramas that take place in little rooms. They are icons for the way language may or may not be able to bridge the distance between people. They are such a persistent dramatic convention that playwrights are occasionally criticized for employing them at all, especially when they do not appear until the end of the play, and then in order to compensate for a weakness in the plot. In Trespassers, the letter appears in the first moments. It is the intrusion that sets the engine of desire in motion. Space, language, eros, the building blocks of theater. Trespasser in a Promised Land uses these elements to explore a landscape central to much of Davis's extensive body of work. A set of lean, dense, demanding, at times nearly inscrutable plays marked by a childlike wonder and a rich, if dry, sense of humor. Trespasser also takes up several interrelated phenomena that are near the heart of many of Russell's plays. The act of lying, a particularly relevant motif these days, the unreliability of the mind, our need to believe, and that needs dangers. To learn more, you have to get the rest of this uh, paper, or better yet, get a copy of the play. <laughs> Uh, just a quick question, Jeff. How many characters are in the play? Uh, about five, six. Five, six. Okay. <coughs> oh no, I'm really losing my, my voice. Mm -hmm. ah, next we have Yvette Nolan. <coughs> Hello. Uh, she's a director, writer, and actor based in Saskatchewan, and she'll be presenting Donna Michelle Sanponer. Honey, Yvette and Dishnikovs, welcome to, uh, this is Dish with One Spoon territory, which is a covenant between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe people about taking care of the land around here and the lakes and everyone who visits. So welcome to this territory on Ab Day, our day, our one day. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about Donna Michelle St. Bernard, who uh, is an MC. she's a word slinger, she's a poet, she, and she's a playwright. I met her first as the general manager for Native Earth Performing Arts. She came to be the general manager at Native Earth. And she said about in the first year, would you mind looking at some of my writing? And I said, sure, thinking she'd bring me a few pages. And she brought me like hundreds of pages. And it was four or five or six plays. And so I, I read them. And then she was like waiting. And she said, so? And I said, so? And she said, well, which one should I work on? And I said, oh, uh, I like this one, Gas Girls. And so she turned her focus to developing Gas Girls, which is a play about uh, two young women on the Zimbabwean border who trade sex for gas in order to live. And then she produced it off the side of her desk at Native Earth with her company, New Harlem. And then she won a, she got nominated for a Governor General's Award for the play. And then she won a Dora for it, uh, which is the Toronto Theatre Award. So she won the Dora Award, and when she went to accept the award for the Dora, she got up on stage and she said, 
this is the first play in my 54 ology. <laughs> and people laughed because she's writing 54 plays about the, the 54 African countries. And people laughed, they thought she was joking. That was 2010. Since then, she's developed and produced a number of plays. There's like a dozen countries she has done. And, um, and the next one that got produced at Persephone is A Man of Fish, also nominated for Governor General's Award. So uh, I'm pretty good at picking them. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why I'm going to tell you that the next one that should be picked up and produced is called Conjugal, and not because I'm attached to it as a dramaturge. Uh, conjugal, so this was Zimbabwe, this was Burundi, Conjugal is Malawi, and it's about a poet who is uh, imprisoned because his words are inciting the people to rebellion and to resistance, because words are dangerous. And Donna Michelle knows it better than anyone else. Uh, she does all kinds of plays. There are TY plays, there's dance theater plays, there's theater, there's linear theater, there's multi-disc theater. She's so prolific, she puts me to shame, and yet she still lets me keep reading her plays <laughs> and choosing which ones she should develop next. I do have a paper. I have some of these, which lists like only eight of the 54ology that she's working on, but you can also go to the 54ology website and take a look at where they are. Like she also lists like, these ones have been done legit, these ones are in workshop stages, these ones can be, like you can actually go, she can't be stopped. Uh, she exhausts me. And Playwrights Canada Press also gave me these uh, plays at, to use as props. Playwrights Canada Press, thank you. And uh, I'm allowed to give these out. So if anyone wants A, one of these plays that I'm giving out, I see someone at the back going, I do. Or uh, B, one of these sheets with a list of the plays and how to get a hold of Don Michelle St. Bernard. Uh, I'll be around, so miigwech. Uh, our next speaker had to put, uh, suddenly go home because of a health emergency with her cat. So, so, and she was going to be talking about a Native American playwright, so that's very unfortunate, doubly so, I think. So we hop so, forward to Jeremy Stoll. I was one of the, I'm sorry, I was one of the dramaturgs on Off the Rails. Would you want me to talk about it? Sure, could you? Yeah, give us a few minutes, a couple minutes. Yay! Yay. Woo! Hi, I'm Waylon Lank. I'm not Jean Bruce Scott. Uh, right, Off the Rails is Randy Reinholtz's adaptation of Measure for Measure. Randy Reinholtz, for those of you who don't know, he's Choctaw. He's the artistic director of uh, Native Voices at the Autry. And he wrote this play when he thought he was going to retire. And he did the, uh, the first workshop there at uh, Native Voices. And then he didn't retire, and the first full production was at OSF. And I had the privilege of being one of the dramaturgs on it. Uh, this is, to my mind, it's better than Measure for Measure. Uh, when I'm reading it, the first time I read it, I was reading the prison scene when the sister tells her brother, hey, so Angelo said that he'll let you go, but only if I have sex with him. And in Randy's play, this becomes a discussion about the ethics, not just of how to survive as a native person, but whether or not it actually is ethical to survive. Is the objection so intense that maybe you're better off dead? Uh, and if not, then how far do you go ethically to save your life and to save the lives of your community? And it becomes a, a drop-down argument between the brother and the sister. And this is the moment that turned me on to the play that made me think, I, I need to work on this. I need to find, I need to, Randy, I want to work on your play. <laughs> uh, and when we did the production at OSF, it was the most amazing opening I've ever been to. We ended the play with a round dance, which is a kind of powwow dance where just anybody can dance. And Stage management, stage management was saying uh, during previews, so you can maybe bring up six people. That might be the, uh, the safe number. And <laughs> in the, uh, the first production, uh, we, we had uh, elders streaming down the aisles to come up on stage. It's not like you're going to tell them no. So we had, I don't know, like 15 or 20 people up in this round dance. And it was, it was heartening. And then Angelo, the bad guy, 
this is, all, this is the only production, this is the only production that I have ever heard a villain being legitimately booed. Uh, which, it says something to Barrett O'Brien and how well he acted, and it also says something to how well Randy wrote a play that resonated with Native audiences. And that, to my mind, to my experience, and being there on opening, and just being a Native person in the room with it, is, it's a very affirmative play. Uh, and it's a very affirmative play to, to have had done at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Uh, right, that's, um, that's all the story I have to say about that. <laughs> well, thank you, Leon. Thank you very much. Uh, Jeremy Stoll is up next. He is another beehiver from the Beehive Dramaturgical Studio in New York. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jeremy Stoller. I'm a New York-based dramaturg. Uh, I respond to story-driven narratives, not necessarily presented in a traditional way, but that take you on a real journey. Uh, I love when I hear the generative artist's distinct point of view on the world in their work, uh, and a masterful use of language. Plays that have a real dramaturgical integrity within themselves that set up their own set of rules and either obey or break them in interesting ways, and that have integrity about how they exist with the world around them. Uh, I love heightened realities and scripts that play around with familiar forms and imagine them anew. Uh, Ricardo Perez Gonzalez does all of these things. He's a playwright based in both New York and LA. He cites his influences Federico Garcia Lorca, Sarah Kane, Tennessee Williams, Rebecca Gilman. He's an alumnus of the Emerging Writers Group at the Public <coughs> Theater in New York. He said the following in an interview about finding his voice when he was in graduate school after a period of trying to keep himself out of his own plays. <laughs> Quote, when I was there, I started thinking about my beliefs and my belief system and my life and identity and belonging and where I fit in the world. And all these pictures starting coming up. These splits being caught between my past and my history, feeling like I'm from Puerto Rico even though I wasn't born there, that's where my family is from, being a disbeliever and somehow still believing in faith and spirit, in the magic of my abuelas. Both of my abuelas dreamed prophecy and that was family history and I believe that, even though I don't believe such things. So there's this bifurcation in the way I see the world." End quote. Uh, Ricardo has several previously produced plays, which I hope you'll check out, but I'm gonna focus on his recent unproduced work. Uh, the play that introduced me to Ricardo is called On the Grounds of Belonging. It's the first in this trilogy of plays that center on the love story between Russell and Thomas, a black man and a white man, which chart their lives from the late 1950s to the present. On the Grounds of Belonging is set in the tight-knit but racially segregated 1950s Houston gay community. It starts when Thomas, on what was supposed to be his drag performance debut at the all-white bar, uh, finds one of the regularly occurring raids going on there. And for his physical safety, he begs entrance, entrance into the Black's only gay bar across the street where he meets Russell. The play doesn't shy away from the genuine danger that the relationship places both of them, but especially Russell, in or the differences in their life experiences, but it also dramatizes the physical and intellectual attraction between the two men and the seductive power they feel in being seen and understood and loved for the first time. The play consciously references Romeo and Juliet in its story of young lovers who connect in a time of turmoil uh, and some of the plot mechanics that allow Russell and Thomas to meet clandestinely and then which later separate them echo Shakespeare's text. But unlike Romeo and Juliet, Russell and Thomas end the play alive. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't reach the tragic ends that mainstream narratives often reserve for gay characters. It's instead something that we haven't seen much of. It's a juicy romance centered on queer people and people of color, charged with intelligence and erotic energy, and characters who are unashamed and unquestioning about their sexuality. It's got this heightened colorful romanticism that also suggests the film melodramas of Douglas Sirk. Uh, it leans fully into this gut punch pulpiness of those movies, but with overtly queer characters. Uh, when I saw it at the public studio and workshop production, the full house went nuts for it. The un unwritten second play in the trilogy has the lovers reuniting decades later, and in the final play, which is written, The More They Stay, Russell and Thomas are in their 80s, living in New York City, having enjoyed decades together, and finding themselves dealing with their deteriorating health and considering dying with dignity, while also caring for a younger gay couple that they have informally adopted. Uh, Russell and Thomas share the challenges of their later years with a lingering heat of sexual attraction and intellectual connection, 
because of the AIDS crisis robbing us of a generation of queer artists mm -hmm. and a generation of queer men who would now be the relative age of Russell and Thomas, this is again a story that we haven't seen a lot of. Both for the quality of its writing and for introducing to a canon a story that we've been starved of, this play is moving and noteworthy. Uh, neither of the existing plays in the trilogy has been produced. The plays are five characters and designed to be produced with a single set of actors uh, in rep in the whole trilogy. Uh, his newest work, which is separate from the trilogy, is called Don't Eat the Mangoes. Three adult sisters living outside of San Juan, Puerto Rico, are faced with the daunting task of caring for their cancer-stricken mother and their wheelchair-bound father. Despite being paralyzed, their abusive father still rules his family through fear and intimidation. By the play's end, both parents have died, one taking their own life, one having their life taken. And their daughters will have begun the process of working through family trauma with varying degrees of success. A marketing team might sell it as Little Foxes Meet Sweet Bird of Youth, crossed with House of Bernardo Alba. And that would kind of give you some sense of it. The lineage that Gonzalez suggested when he referenced Lorca and Williams and Kane can be seen here. Uh, again, he's stirring up a recognizable form, which is the American family drama, and at, with colors, with characters of color, with queerness, with elements of the supernatural. Uh, there's revelations in the play. There's a family secret that's not going to shock anyone who's, who's seen plays as much as it shocks the members of the family. But Gonzalez knows, but Gonzalez knows this, and he builds the play not around the revelations of what's happened, but how the family confronts it. Uh, he squeezes every element of drama and beauty and poetry and horror that he can out of his stories. And like Williams at his best, he brings you right to the edge of too muchness without crossing over, which I love. Uh, his plays center around family units, and they take familiar forms that we already know and know that we enjoy and populate them with queer characters and people of color. Uh, there's always a high entertainment value. The combination of the expected and the unexpected makes them wildly satisfying and completely watchable. Uh, he's also a great and bold rewriter in the rehearsal room uh, and a lovely human being, so I hope you'll check out his work. Yeah. Thank you, Jeremy. Our final presenter, Gavin Witt, from the center stage in Baltimore, where he's an artistic associate. Something nice. <laughs> Something good title. <laughs> you almost made it. <laughs> you did it. You did it. At the end. Pardon uh, coughing paroxysms if they take me over. Uh, I want to be sure to thank you, Michael, for putting this together in another year. It's wonderful. And thank you to all the other presenters for sharing your passion and insight into that work. It's just what a tremendous value this adds, I find, to LMDA. Uh, Gavin Wade, he, him, his, Baltimore Center Stage, proud LMDA board member. Um, and it's my privilege today to talk about Miranda Rose Hall. Um, so Baltimore native, uh, currently living and working out of Charm City, uh, but poised to explode beyond that. Uh, um, she came to Baltimore Center Stage initially uh, for a year-long playwriting residency uh, kind of with the aim of working on her graduate school admission play. Uh, she wrote a ton of other plays. Uh, didn't really work on that one so much, but uh, did, did proceed off to Yale for her MFA. Uh, she's now a year out uh, uh, back in Baltimore in the interim, and uh, I think very much poised for a breakout. Um, the play that she sanctioned me to talk about, The Hour of Great Mercy, um, will have its world premiere at Diversionary Theater this winter, and uh, her more recent play, Plot Points in Our Sexual Development, uh, is slated, I think it's not yet announced, unfortunately, so it is slated for what I will euphemistically say is a New York premiere, <laughs> a fairly, fairly significant uh, and noteworthy New York premiere that Margot Bordelon will direct. Uh, so keep an eye out for Miranda uh, uh, on those. Um, that's coming this fall. Uh, it, it, it's hard to pin one work down. Uh, Miranda, I have found, writes a wildly diverse array of work. Uh, we did a reading of Menstruation, a period piece uh, for women's voices uh, that was tremendous. She has a piece called Bulgaria, Revolt, that uh, based on some political and traditional narratives of Bulgaria, um, but also writes uh, sort of deeply human, more naturalistic work like this. Um, 
tends to be focused on queer characters and, and experiences, um, uh, not exclusively, uh, but, uh, or, and inevitably in every work, I think, manifests a powerful, profound sense of empathy towards all of her characters in a remarkable way. Even characters who you would think would have every reason to be despicable uh, in that work, uh, Miranda finds a way to, to explore their humanity uh, and the sort of network of obligation and relationship <coughs> that, that drive everyone. Um, I have printed out, maybe sort of if you want to pick up more, uh, you know, contact info and a bio. Uh, you can find her on NPX, uh, your agent info. But So this will be, I'll drop it off to the side after. Um, Hour of Great Mercy, uh, which I was uh, lucky, it was her thesis piece at Yale. Uh, I was lucky enough to direct it at the MFA Playwrights Workshop last summer. Uh, it was then featured in the uh, NNPM Showcase in Orlando. Um, Diversionary, as I said, is doing it. Uh, it's ready for rolling world premiere, uh, other productions. I think it's, it's very much worth picking up. Uh, a diverse cast of five, including two Asian American actors, um, uh, facing a personal crossroads and a dire diagnosis. Ed, until recently a Jesuit priest based out of Baltimore, the Catholic capital, uh, returns to the icy and isolated confines of Bethlehem, Alaska, in a last ditch effort to reconcile with his estranged family. Upon arrival, he finds a community still shaken by a five-year-old tragedy that also overturned his own life and in which he, uh, and for which his complicity is in question. As Ed, his brother, and the tight-knit but tightly wound community test the limits of their capacity to forgive and forget, unexpected and un unforeseen love, along with new bonds of found family, blossom beneath the starry Alaskan sky. That's a teaser account to play for you. Um, the, but I think uh, characteristically, I would say, the piece was inspired in part by a combination of real life experiences and observations uh, that uh, Miranda drew on, uh, filtered through her kind of wild ca imaginative capacity. Based in part on, uh, these include, based in part on the two years the playwright spent serving marginalized populations and communities with the Jesuit Volunteer Corps Northwest. Uh, the portions of that time she spent in Anchorage and elsewhere in Alaska. Alaska is very much a recurring backdrop to her work, uh, literally, but also kind of, sort of the, the networks of those communities and the nature of that isolation and how people forge bonds within it. Uh, and the player's direct experience with radio broadcasting via her father's work as an on-air host, uh, specifically his extended documentary project that recorded, literally and figuratively, the decline and death uh, from ALS of a close family friend, uh, the realities of which uh, she implanted into the hour of great mercy. Um, uh, as it's, there's, the biography includes, or her, if you look at NBX, includes the many residencies she's done, the other affiliations she's done that include New York Theater Workshop, Playwright uh, Rattlestick, Playwrights Realm, uh, Orchard Project. Uh, I, I, as we've heard on a number of these cases, and Jeremy just pointed out, also a tremendous human being to work with, a great rewriter and reviser, uh, directing a workshop uh, this fall of a different play of hers. Uh, I would get up to make adjustments with actors and start talking only to have her sort of probably say, I already rewrote that section. <laughs> uh, it's, it's cut, it's changed. She's very collaborative in the room, really intuitive, works extremely well with actors, uh, and I cannot endorse her highly enough to your attention. Uh, I'll wrap it up there. Uh, thanks again for the opportunity. Yay. Thank you. Yay. Over here if you want. <laughs> yeah, I think everyone will agree with me that there's an awful lot of good plays out there that we wouldn't have heard of if we hadn't been here. Uh, it kind of reminded me of a Norwegian saying, if you want to catch big fish, you have to throw your net far out. <laughs> think, think, think about it. <laughs> uh, another thing I enjoyed about the session personally is hearing other dramaturgs excited, <coughs> refuels, refuels my own enthusiasm for theater. So thank you to all, all of our presenters and you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.